So welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight to our lecture. Um, my name is Felice Stonestrom, and I manage the community programs at Stanford Children's Health. And um, just a couple of things before we begin. Um, you probably noticed the lecture is being videotaped tonight, so we do ask that you hold all your questions to the end, at which point we'll turn off the cameras and you can ask your questions anonymously. So tonight's lecture is titled, How to Avoid Picky Eaters from Infancy to Early Childhood. And we are honored to have three speakers tonight with a combined experience of 55 years working here at Packer Children's Health. Amy Fahey is an occupational therapist with advanced practice in feeding and swallowing. She has worked at Stanford Children's Health for the past five years and also has many years of experience in private clinics and school systems. She currently works with both inpatient and outpatient pediatric patients with a focus on infant feeding. For tonight's presentation, Amy will give an overview of the development of infant feeding skills. Gretchen Flanagan is a registered dietitian with over 20 years of clinical experience working with infants, children, and teens at Packer Children's Hospital, Stanford. She currently is working with the outpatient gastrointestinal team where she collaborates with physicians, nurses, occupational therapists, and parents to solve difficult feeding problems. Tonight, she will address the nutritional needs of healthy growing children. And Annette Van Boldrick is an occupational therapist who has worked at Packer Children's Hospital Stanford for 24 years. She has advanced practice in feeding and swallowing. She has worked in all areas of occupational therapy here, but her current focus is, is with infants and toddlers with feeding and swallowing issues. She also performs video fluoroscopic swallow studies in conjunction with radiology when indicated. She enjoys mentoring and collaborating with her peers, and tonight she will discuss how to manage picky eating. So please join me in welcoming our speakers tonight. Okay, so my name's Amy. I'm an occupational therapist here at Packard. I'm going to start out by talking about the oral motor portion of feeding. From there, we'll have Gretchen talk about nutrition, and then Annette will wrap things up by giving some specific tips and strategies on how to avoid picky eating. So this is a photo by a photographer and mom, Caitlin DeManico, that shows the relationship of feeding between moms and their babies. You'll notice that these babies are being fed in many different ways. They are being breastfed, bottle fed, formula fed. Moms are pumping and tube feeding. The purpose of this photo is to show you that there is no right or wrong way to feed your baby as long as you have a positive and healthy relationship with your child. You're going to hear lots of information from us tonight, so if you question anything, just talk to your doctor and know that not every tip and strategy might be right for what works for your specific child and family needs, and that's okay. So moving on to oral motor development, as infants, they are working on coordination with nippling with breast milk or formula as the primary nutrition. At four to six months old, most babies are developmentally ready to try their first solid foods. Lots of changes are happening at that age. Baby's jaw is elongating, their mouth is getting bigger, um, they are showing more interest in the stuff that we're eating. Babies are much more alert and interactive at this age. They might reach out for food. They might smile or drool when they smell food. And baby's head control is also improving. They can hold their head up. They don't need to be able to sit completely unsupported, but they need to sit in some sort of feeding chair without tipping over to the side. The first foods are a thin puree, and it's still very normal for babies to suck the food off the spoon. 
And with that sucking, you're gonna have some tongue protrusion. So the tongue is gonna push some of the food out still. And that doesn't mean that they don't like the food when it comes out of their mouth. It's just a normal developmental stage at this point. So we're gonna show a video. This is this baby's sweet first experience with solid foods, which is sweet potatoes. Yummy, it's so good. Good girl. Good girl. Mmm. Good girl. Do you want some more? Allie's very first food. Five months old. Yum. Okay, from six to eight months old, babies show more and more interest in solid foods. You might start, start offering foods twice a day towards the end of that time period. Babies will start to eat a thicker puree and they also have the ability to hold a large piece of food like a cracker or teething biscuit and bring it to their mouth. They're still munching with an up and down jaw motion with their tongue and jaw not quite chewing yet. At nine months, the tongue starts to become much more involved. It's moving side to side, which allows for much better control of textures. Babies at this age are managing lumpy and mashed foods quite well, and soft foods like steamed vegetables, breads, pastas, and soft fruits can start to be introduced. Babies start chewing at this age to the sides of their mouth, even if they don't have teeth, which is really important to, to know that you don't have to have teeth to do all of this chewing and managing of these softer foods. They also are working on their pincher grasp starting to pick things up with their fingers like this, like blueberries or Cheerios, and bring those types of foods to their mouths as well. So this is a video at nine months of broccoli. And so she is self-feeding herself. She can bring it to her mouth. She still requires to be fed from a caregiver. She's not going to eat a whole entire meal with her fingers by herself, but this is a good experience for her to have the practice with. And this baby didn't have teeth until after 12 months. Any teeth, actually. So she's managing the teeth. Is that good broccoli? Do you want more broccoli? Allie, do you want more broccoli? You have enough. Yum. And she really liked it. Um, at 12 months, most toddlers at this point are capable of eating solid foods and table foods that the family's eating in smaller portions and cut up into smaller bites. But Chewing is more refined. They're using a more diagonal chewing pattern. Um, again, even without teeth, they can handle most textures. Um, once the molars come in, they can handle harder textures like an apple or um, carrot stick or a tougher piece of meat. So this is a 12-month-old eating some pasta. And this toddler was also eating regular meals, uh, meatballs, uh, soft meatballs cut up into cubes, cubed vegetables, soups, things like that. So at this age is when things start to switch over to being more of a food-based diet with liquid supplements, which Gretchen will talk more about as well. And then, we'll let this video finish. Okay, 
So from that point forward, toddlers are working on independence in feeding skills. They're working on using utensils, using a spoon, using a fork, bringing the food to their mouths. And variety is key. They're experiencing new foods all the time. So this slide talks about the importance of sensory development. Babies need experience touching, smelling, and tasting new flavors. This baby is not eating a pickle for nutrition, but she is bringing it to her mouth. She has it inside her mouth to desensitize her gag reflex. She's tasting a new flavor. She has pickle juice on her hands. Um, a lot of times babies try to get into things and mouth toys and mouth things and we're often saying, no, don't touch that, that's dirty or you're gonna choke or that's a bag of diaper wipes. Food is a great way to do this in a safe and developmentally appropriate way. They also need experiences with touching food and feeling it. Um, experiencing it from multi-sensory angles rather than just being forced to have something that they've never tried before. If you think about having a new food that you've never had before, maybe you're at a new restaurant or a different country, somebody gives you something you've never seen, you're not going to just eat it. You're going to poke it with your fork. Is it hard? Is it soft? You're gonna bring it to your nose and smell it. Maybe bring it to your lips and take a little nibble before you put the whole thing in your mouth. And even then, you're probably gonna take a small bite to start with. Babies need those same experiences with foods. It's very normal for them to want to explore and, and smell things and feel things on their hands before they feel comfortable with it in their mouth. Um, so that's all I have. Hopefully that gives you a good basic understanding of some oral motor development and expectations for this age. So I'm going to hand it over to Gretchen who's going to talk more about the nutrition. All right. Well, as parents, grandparents, and prospective parents, we are concerned about the foods we feed our kids. We want to be sure that we're providing the healthiest foods possible. However, we're confused. We don't understand what makes a food healthy. Does that mean it's organic? Is it, are there should I be concerned about pesticides? How about GMOs? Don't worry, I don't have the answers. <laughs> but our food market is exploding with new food products designed to convince us that we should be purchasing these foods. OK, so let's talk about real food. <laughs> um, as we know, food fuels the body. And food is composed of three main ingredients, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. The ideal fuel contains the majority of carbohydrate with a fair amount of protein and a sprinkle of fat. So let's look at the toddler plate. The plate method is a way to put that ideal fuel mixture into real foods. As you look at the plate, the carbohydrates are provided by the fruits, vegetables, and grains. You can see that's 3 quarters of the plate is carbohydrate. The protein is represented by the meats, and you can see that looks like about a quarter of the plate. The meats are the building blocks of, um, for growth and development. And fats are how we prepare the food. They are not a food group in and of themselves. So that plate provides the ideal fuel in the ideal quantities of those essential ingredients. Now milk 
can provide that same mixture of carb, protein, and fat, and can be a standalone or an accompaniment to the plate itself. So that is the ideal blend of nutrition. Now let's keep in mind that the early months in an infant's life, they're primarily taking breast milk or formula. And both breast milk and formula have this ideal mix of carb, protein, and fat, uniquely designed to meet the needs of the rapidly growing infant. However, as the uh, child grows and we introduce other foods, keeping that balance gets a little more difficult to manage. So it is a very gradual, building in these new foods is a very gradual and individual process. There's no one right way to do it. So we're gonna skip ahead and talk about the toddler um, diet. Now, this is the part where I'd like to talk about, let me see if I can find that. Um, uh, how toddlers eat. And we know that toddlers are not consistent eaters. That means they don't eat the same amounts at the same times from one day to the next. And in fact, they eat when they're hungry and they stop when they're full. Most adults don't have this down. Um, so it is unique to this country that, that we um, talk about uh, feeding our children every three hours because they need fuel every three hours. <coughs> and we name that three meals and three snacks. So six opportunities a day to eat. Now, with that three meals and three snacks, there is a misconception among most kids and some adults that meals are opportunities to where you get foods that are good for you. And snacks are opportunities to eat the foods you want to eat. And those are the ones that mostly you tear open. So, Unfortunately, our children need fuel every three hours, and they need this balance of carbohydrate, protein, and fat every three hours for optimal nutrition. So we, I'm wondering if we need to rethink this whole meal and snack concept and turn it into mini meals. So if we give kids opportunities five or six times a day to have a mini meal, we may be getting better nutrition for our kids. They may learn a style of eating that helps them prevent some of the negative consequences of the style of eating that many of us have today. Something to think about. So now that we know what constitutes a mini meal, let's look at portion sizes. Now, this slide represents the same meal for four different ages, age one, two, three, and four. And what you'll notice is that the plate sizes are the same. The only thing that changes is how much food and slight textures is appropriate for the different years. So a good rule of thumb, and many folks are kind of shocked by this recommendation, a good rule of thumb is one tablespoon per food item per year of age. So if we look at the portion size for a one-year-old, that would be one tablespoon of strawberries, one tablespoon of green beans, and two tablespoons of mac and cheese. Cheese representing the protein, mac, the pasta representing the grain. And the milk portion is about one to two ounces. Now that's not to say that that's what your child's going to eat, but that's a good place to start. 
if we sit down with a young child, a young one-year-old, and give them the amount that is more appropriate for a four-year-old, we may not feel that we are parenting and getting our kids to eat what we think they should eat. Sometimes our expectations about what a child needs to eat do not match with the real nutrition needs of a child. The one nice thing about having five to six opportunities to eat like this is that it gives the child the opportunity to keep that balance of nutrition, whether they eat all of it one day or one meal or eat none of it one meal. It, it will balance itself out if we allow it to. Your child may not be satisfied with the amount that you present them, and that's fine too. They can have more. This just represents a good place to start. Now keep in mind that this plate is quite small. This is about a five inch diameter plate and it's up on the table in the back if you want to take a look. So if you're dishing your child food onto an adult size plate, you may be missing the mark. Because what we tend to do, and it's human nature, we put appropriate portions according to the size of the plate. So most adults eat on too large a plate as a good place to start. Most adults need no more than a nine inch plate. So something to check out at home and see how you're doing with your own plates. Um, so, let's see. Now, another important role of the parent is to offer variety. As a dietitian with lots of years experience and two children, I can guarantee you that if you ask a child what they want to eat, they will tell you the same three foods. Cheese pizza, chicken nuggets, and mac and cheese. I can also guarantee you they won't ask for broccoli, cauliflower, or Brussels sprouts. Now, we know that it takes about 15 to 20 exposures of a new food before a child will accept that food. Now, notice how I didn't say, will like that food, but they will accept it. So, one of the biggest responsibilities of parents is to offer those mini meals with a balance of food groups to achieve that ideal fuel and mix it up all the time. That is one of the biggest keys to avoiding picky eating. Parents are responsible for putting the food on the plate. Kids are responsible for whether they eat or not. And sometimes it's not, and that's okay. Um, <clears throat> so what can you do to create a healthy feeding environment at home? Well, we can start with establishing those mini meals every three hours or so. We can build in the healthy balance of nutrition in appropriate portion sizes. So here's where I really think it's important to take a look at the amount of food you're expecting your child to consume. It not, may not need to be as much as you're offering. The child may feel uh, overwhelmed if they're given too much food and may not want to even begin. So portion size is key. 
So establish those regular mini meals and take a break from activities and enjoy a mini meal with your child. So that means, you know, have a picnic in the backyard or on the living room floor to make it interesting and fun. Stop what you're doing. Maybe it's um, sit at the dining room table or at the toddler table and have a tea party with your child. One of the biggest concerns I have are busy parents that do a majority of their snack meals in the car. And they need convenience to not mess up the car. I'm going to recommend that you pull the car over and climb in the back seat and have a mini meal with your child. Family meals. We need to join them. We need to make the environment conducive to leaving food on the plate, to finishing it all and asking for more. Whatever we want our children to do, whether it's have good table manners or learn to uh, enjoy new foods, we need to do it with them. Oops. And then one last thing I wanted to say is that if you have provided the right fuel in reasonable portion sizes, your children will be able to eat the amount they need. And we don't need to worry about it. Okay. I'm going to now pass off uh, the presentation to Annette, who's going to talk about if all of our good intentions have gone away and we <laughs> We have ended up with some picky eating. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? All right. Um, let me just get into my slide as well. So I, I'm going to show you three videos. And um, I want you to just react to them. Some of you have experienced this if you already have a baby. Some of you, I saw some pregnant women in here, um, maybe experiencing it in the future. I've just pulled these down from YouTube. And um, I, being a little bit of a feeding nerd, I have looked at lots of baby's first meal videos on YouTube, and I find them enlightening. I'm not sure what to think about this. OK. It's avocado. Avocado. But it's cold. <laughs> oh. Wait a minute, is it not good? She like it. <laughs> okay. Um, first comment on this one is this baby's not choking. This baby's not dying. This baby, I actually really like hearing the parents laugh in the background. Okay. So let's look at the next one. See if I do a better job on this myself. Here we go. Watch her eyes. Where is she looking? She's looking at her parents. She is like, oh my gosh, what the heck is this? <laughs> the parents are laughing. It's the right response. And watch. Oh, it's, okay. And I'm just going to do one more and show you this one. And then we'll talk about it a little bit. These guys are all adorable. Peace. You see the shutter? Watch the eyes. He's looking at the parents. Can I another bite? There we go. Oh, You're going to see another big reaction. It's like, oh. He's not choking. He's not Do you dying. not like peas, buddy? Oh, he can barely He's still breathe. just kind of hanging out in there. He's still opening his mouth. He has not shut down. He is still accepting this, even though it makes him shudder. That's good stuff. It's crying. It's so good. <laughs> Taking it down. 
And he has probably hit his limit. I don't think we like these. Oh, jeez. Okay. okay. So I have uh, just a couple of points to make about this. He's not loving this food. This is not his favorite food. But what I appreciate very much that these parents did is they kept it positive. I've looked at an equal number of these kind of videos where the parents are going, oh, he doesn't like it. And you could just hear, and the baby is making eye contact with these parents and shutting down. I can't tell you how wonderful it is when I see this kind of video where the parents are not freaking out about these gags. Babies will gag. They will gag if the texture is really strange. They will gag if this taste is something that they have just not gotten their heads wrapped around yet. His whole body was reacting. His breathing changed, he shuddered, but he kept opening his mouth. And that was in large part because of how the parents were approaching it. Um, would we ask this baby to eat very many more bites? Probably not. But that was a successful feeding, believe it or not. I mean, the baby trusted the parents. What happens, this is like when your, your little one is starting to learn to walk and they're walking along and they trip and they fall down. They fall down and then they look at you and go, am I okay? And if the parent's going, oh my gosh, you fell down, the baby will cry. And if the parents are going, oh, you fell down, let's get up, the baby won't cry. And it's kind of a similar approach that I take with these kids that are gagging. Um, if you um, keep it light and have reasonable expectations, it was a slow pace of feeding. They weren't going quick, quick, quick. They weren't putting big giant spoonfuls in the baby's mouth. Um, and all of those things together, the baby still trusts the parents. And that's the really key part of the relationship with feeding and introducing some of these foods. Now, going forward, was that peas? I can't remember. Um, does that mean, ah, uh, I'm not gonna get, it, get the peas because you know, they really weren't that successful. You don't wanna create excuse me, <coughs> the mental list of, oh, my baby likes these foods and my baby doesn't like these foods because I'll only work on these foods. I literally had a friend whose baby, I walked in and I saw her one time, and the baby had a perfectly orange circle on the tip of her nose. It was perfectly round. I'd never seen anything like it. It's like, what's wrong with her nose? She was on a carrot binge, and they were just feeding her carrots. And I went back three weeks later, and there was no more orange nose, and she wasn't eating carrots at all. It was like, okay. Um, what you want, what your attitude about introducing foods should be is, I know they're foods that my baby will eat more of, will eat more rapidly, will eat without all this going on, but that doesn't mean I don't reintroduce these foods that are a little bit more challenging. Could I, so um, I had a baby that would eat avocado, and we all know avocado is just this wonder food, and we all like our babies to eat avocados. And so I worked with a mom and I said, okay, what's the food the baby does like? And I think it was pears. And so we were feeding the baby some pears. And then we took a teeny bit of avocado and mostly pears and we introduced that. And we gradually changed the proportion of pears to avocado. And then the baby really turned into an avocado lover. So there's these different things that you can do to um, help the baby accept more and more foods. But you don't say, that's on the list of foods I'm not gonna do again. That mental list that you have is the list that's called, I will try this again, maybe a little bit differently. Okay, but not, that food's off the list, that food's off the list. We had a baby um, that was, came into us eating two white things, coconut, water, and pear, because the parent, and this is extreme, but the parent was trying things and this list was just getting smaller and smaller and finally we had this very undernourished child come in living on nothing. So what do you fear? You know, when you start to have struggles with a picky eater, um, there's usually some, some voice in the back of your head that is making you worry. 
Um, maybe they're saying, oh, your baby's not gaining weight enough. And it's like, oh my gosh, I have to feed this baby more and more and more. Maybe your baby's a gagger. Um, maybe you have, you just feel like every time you sit down, it's like, oh, I have got to engage in this battle again to get this child to eat or to take these foods or to, you know, to eat something besides French fries. Um, maybe it's being ostracized. Maybe like your mother-in-law um, or your mom is saying, why can't you feed your baby? I could feed you or some family member. There's a lot of social stigma to children that don't eat easily. Um, and that one's actually huge. And then um, a fear, inadequate nutrition. I can't get my child to eat vegetables. I can't get my child to eat this mini meal balanced diet, you know. So be aware of what's driving you with your potential meal issues. Okay, so eating should be a messy experience. You can't expect that every meal is gonna be like this because you will go through 20 sets of clothes in a day and life will be impossible. But you know, one meal a day like this, it's kind of awesome. And you'll notice that these are really huge hunks of avocado. Um, and even if she puts some of this in her mouth, she'll manage. If she takes too big a bite, she'll spit it out, okay? I think a lot of parents are very afraid of their babies and afraid of choking and that sort of thing. So we need to, um, we need to be aware. And this one looks like she died, but it's beets. And she likes beets. And it's just this horrible, messy me a meal. But playing with food actually is really important. I have a lot of kids I see in therapy where I will put a cracker on their tray and they'll pick it up and they'll eat it. But I'll put something wet, like a piece of fruit or a piece of uh, vegetable on their tray, and they touch it and they literally recoil. Their hands go like this. It's like, I'm not touching that. And I just can't encourage you enough to, you know, the, the idea behind being messy with food is to interact with it, to smell it, touch it, taste it, and be familiar with it here because you're not going to put something in your mouth that feels gross here. If it feels gross in your hands, it's grosser in your mouth. Okay? So that's what this is all about. Okay. So there, let's say you already have a picky eater. Um, there's a concept called food chaining. And the idea with food chaining is you take baby steps. This is not giant steps. Um, you might, you have a child who eats a lot of french fries. You're not going to go from french fries to sweet potato fries. That is a giant leap. But you might go from french fries from McDonald's to french fries that are homemade to french fries that are cut in a different length and work your way in those tiny baby steps to accepting a wider variety of french fries. In this example, it's like the Kraft, sorry, <coughs> I've been talking too much all day. Um, Kraft mac and cheese, you know, it's like that's the only one, has to come in the box, it can't be homemade, none of that. So how are we going to chain this food so that we break it open a little bit and have a wider variety. And you might do something like same sauce, different pasta shape, um, same pasta baked or baked in a muffin shape. I'm finally working so that you can put some uh, vegetables mixed into the, to the pasta. But this is baby steps. And, and this is actually, there's a lot more steps to get to where the vegetables are. But this is just to introduce the concept of um, food chaining. And like Gretchen said before, don't overwhelm with huge portions. Keep it small and unintimidating. When I'm doing feeding therapy, I'm, I'll put two Cheerios on the tray and maybe start there and work my way up. Because if you put a lot on, they'll go and it's all on the floor. So you have to keep it manageable. One of the things that I can't tell you is it's so important is listen to yourself. Listen to the message, okay? Um, how many of us said, you're not getting off the table till you clean your plate? Or you can't have dessert if you don't finish your peas? Or some of these directive, assertive messages that set you up for a power struggle. If you set up a power struggle, you lose. I'm sorry, there's just no way around it. If you say you must do this, this will happen. You could tell me that I have to eat 
goat cheese. I have tried. I have tried. I cannot tell you how hard I've tried. I've eaten little bits of goat cheese, and it's finally to the point where it's like, I'm done. I'm not doing goat cheese. And if you say I can't have dessert until I eat my goat cheese, sorry, I'll skip the dessert. Because for me, it's just, I can't do it. And I, I'm really digressing right now, but I have to tell you a fun story. I did a picky eating talk for a group of foster parents, and we asked them two questions. The one question was, um, what's your favorite food, and what's the food you won't eat? So everybody went around the room, and one guy said, I hate peanut butter. And another guy said, that's all I eat for lunch every day, peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You know, And so we had people, same food, polar opposite. And there was one person there who was Panamanian. And when we asked her what her favorite food was, it was chicken feet. <laughs> and it was like, we all kind of went, really? <laughs> and she said, it is wonderful. It's my favorite thing. So we have to understand that within our goal of having this great variety, there are sometimes things that just don't appeal to us. And that's OK. So um, when, when you're talking to the child, you can say when they try a bite of a new food, good bite. You tried that and you've never had broccoli before. Good bite. Um, you can model, and I can't tell you, say, I love this broccoli. It is my favorite thing and I, lo I love this. So you're gonna kind of model that behavior. You can say, let's try this. Um, if the child's older, you can kind of have the thing as, you know, we can try it and we can say we like it a lot or we don't like it very much or we really don't like it, but let's try it. Let's see what we think. Um, eat your colors is a concept like, you know, um, a bell pepper might be green or red or orange, or cauliflower might be white, or a pear or a peach might, you know, have their own colors. And just kind of encouraging the concept of we should eat food of many colors. What colors did you eat? Golden, french fries, nuggets, you know, let's, let's work on another color. Um, and then really my favorite one is when you're ready, you will eat this. And the idea behind this is um, there are foods, and I'm jumping ahead to my tips a little bit, but I'll just talk about it here. You don't want to be a short order cook. You don't want to cook fries and nuggets for this one. And you know, the, uh, this one over here only eats whatever. And you know, you are just preparing individual meals for everybody in the family instead of you're making your family balanced meal. Um, a lot of times you have the green beans and the strawberries and the whatever on the plate and the child's going, I don't eat green beans. The message is when you're ready, you'll eat green beans. It could take months or whatever, but the green beans are on the plate. It's not that I don't want green beans on my plate. When you're ready, you can eat the green beans. But the green beans need to be on your plate because we all have green beans on our plate. Okay, it's a very positive message. It's not a, you know, you have to eat your green beans kind of message, but it's when you're ready, you will eat the green beans. That was me and artichokes. I thought they were kind of weird. And I love artichokes. You know, you just never know, but they keep reappearing. It's not, I can't put this on the plate. I can't put that on the plate. It appears on the plate. Okay. Okay, so um, grazing. If you are having that fear, my child is underweight, I'm not getting the nutrition in, there's this, this compulsion to say, let's have a snack. Let's, I had a friend um, who we were having their child's birthday party, and while she was unwrapping the presents, they were shoving her sippy cup in her mouth. It's like, take a break. Now, I can't say that to my friends always, but you know, relax, have a meal and a break, and a meal and a break. Don't come at them with little snippets of food all day long, okay? Um, limit choices and don't be a short order cook. So the idea again behind this is you present the meal, um, the meal has options within it, and this is what we're eating. Uh, Ellen Satter has uh, the approach of saying, put the dessert there. Don't say you can't have this until you have that. It's all there. If you plan to serve a dessert, have a dessert. Do you have to have a dessert every night? No. But don't save it as the carrot out here. Um, 
try dips and condiments. So I can't tell you broccoli, broccoli's trees, right? You say, oh, look, there's a tree. Let's put snow on the tree. And now we have ranch dressing and oh my gosh, we're gonna eat the broccoli with this, with snow, trees and snow, trees and snow. Um, you know, kind of be creative with it. Um, hummus, ketchup, mustard, I don't care. But if it takes adding a little something extra onto the fruit or vegetable, that's fine, that's totally fine. Um, once again, I can't tell you variety, variety, variety. What happens is we have between six, nine months and two years of age to make all the, you know, offer all the variety that we can. When, when we hit the, the two year age range, that's gonna shrink. It's normal behavior. Two year olds kind of go whoop like this and it's like, I'm not eating that, I'm not eating that. But you know what? If you're calm, you're relaxed, and you keep offering the foods, it comes back out. But if you start from a variety like this instead of a variety like this, it's a lot less intimidating to go from here to here instead of from here to here. It's not, not so scary. Um, include them in food prep. They'll handle food, they'll learn about cooking, they'll have a really good time. So what do you do with the little one? You've chopped up the vegetable or the whatever, and it's here, let's get those little hands picking it up and putting it in the bowl, and you're gonna, or the pot, and you're gonna stir it. Um, one of my favorite things is these learning towers that they've got for little kids, where they can stand and they have the little cage around them so that they're not gonna fall off. Pull them up to the counter and it's like, okay, what can we do together, you know, and just, See if there is an element of that. If you're working and you're exhausted and you're going, I am not gonna do this after work, do it on the weekends. You know, that sort of thing. I'm not saying this all has to be all the time, but, but be very inclusive in terms of what you're doing with, with meal times. Um, they'll learn to be good cooks and eat together. <coughs> I would say one social meal a day where you see mommy's eating the broccoli. I'm picking on broccoli today. <laughs> mommy's eating the broccoli, daddy's eating the broccoli, baby's eating the broccoli. You know, just model model this and go, oh, this is delicious or whatever. Um, take a picture. To, so this is, this is kind of a fun one that you might do if you really have a picky eater. You know, capture a positive, a little video snippet or a little photo of the child putting that new food up to their mouth and trying this new food and go, Look, do you remember when you tried that? What a good good adventure that was. Wasn't that, you know, that sort of thing. Kids love to look at themselves. It's their favorite subject. Um, get it? <laughs> I don't kid. Um, set a realistic goal. If it's something like those peas, one or two or three bites is a huge success. It's not like this big mound of food. Don't have a clean plate rule. Don't have the list of foods that you can't, can't feed. Keep the, keep the fears out of this. Be calm, be um, encouraging. Don't bring your stress into this. Um, it, like we said, it can take 15, 20 times sometimes. I had a, a friend who was an OT and a feeding therapist and her little guy would not eat cottage cheese. And she was really like, oh, I can't get him to eat cottage cheese. It was very funny. And she kept putting it on the plate. He, and one day she decided that she wouldn't call it cottage cheese, she just called it cottage. Here's your cottage. He ate it. Who knows, was it because she changed the name, was because she tried it enough times? Who knows, but after that he ate cottage cheese. So keep your stress low, maybe be a little bit creative, but keep the power struggles out of, out of the uh, equation. You don't want to do that. Skip the baby aisle. So this is, <laughs> this is Gretchen and I, we both kind of feel like, um, my thing is, it used to be pureed baby food, and, and that was kind of it. And then they came out with stage one, stage two, stage three, toddler. Nobody should be buying toddler baby food, in my opinion. Feed them something that you're eating. Um, you, can, um, you can make your own baby food, like you're having a sweet potato for dinner, make a little too much, put it in your blender, uh, put it in an ice cube tray, make little portions. Once it's frozen, break it out of the ice cube tray, put it in a Ziploc bag, and then go, I'll have a cube of sweet potato, a cube of this, a cube of that, there's your meal. So it's not even that you have to make it fresh every minute, but you can, you know, it's not that hard to take a sweet potato, cook it up, and make something delicious. Um, babies can have, you know, babies can have seasoning. 
six month olds, maybe not so much. Single, you know, we're kind of in the single food stage. But if you are eating something, you're eating spaghetti, and your child's like like this, put a dab of spaghetti sauce on your finger and give them a lick. Okay? Let them kind of have these flavors. Don't go, this is my food, this is your food. If they're interested in what's on your plate, figure out a way, fork mash it, do something to it, put, you know, finger mash it, go here, have a little taste. Incorporate them into what you're eating. It makes a big difference. Have fun. You know, laugh like these parents. Have a good time with it. Um, and just kind of enjoy and make it as positive an experience as you're able to.